Hello and welcome everyone. Happy Friday. Hope everyone had a lovely week, is ready for the weekend, but before we get there, is ready for another subsector spotlight. Today, we're going to be talking about one of the hottest industries at the or sorry, one of the hottest sectors at the moment. The utility sector has made absolutely massive improvements in the past 2 weeks, but also and mainly in the past week to rise to become one of our sector relative strength leaders. So it's only appropriate that we talk about one of the top sector one of the top industries that has been leading that charge, regulated water. It's a term that many of you may not be familiar about, but it's something that we all need. It doesn't matter who you are, where you live, access to clean and safe drinking water is something that everyone needs is a basic human right and the regulated water industry in the United States is the industry that helps us achieve that. So today I want to go into that a little bit. I want to talk about what the regulated water industry is, what that first part of the word means, regulated, what that means, and then talk about some of the companies that are leading this industry talk about some ETFs that give us some exposure to this industry. And lastly, we're going to be using the new addition to the Sectors Made Simple dashboard, which is custom matrices, to compare the top seven companies within this sector, or sorry, within this industry, as well as looking at and comparing the different ETFs that give us exposure to regulated water. So that's the topic for today. Before we get into it, I want to say hello to everyone we have with us live. Hello, Blaze, Emilida, Nora, Andrew, Veronica, Eddie, Kira, my mom, Erika, Elizabeth, Laura, Kike, Iwumi, that's a new name. Welcome. Welcome to our webinars. Margarita, Lucy, Lucia, Ana, Sotero, Nancy, Irma. JJ, Danny, great to see you all. Thank you all so much for being here. If you're watching this recorded and you're around on Friday afternoons and want to join us live, we record all of these webinars live at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern time. So that's 4 p.m. Los Angeles time, 7 p.m. New York time. I'm not going to keep you any longer. Let's get straight into today's topic, which is all about the regulated water industry. So, Usual disclaimer, we're going to talk about some stocks today, we're going to talk about an industry, take this as educational purposes, not as financial advice, past results can never, never guarantee future performance, so always do your own research before making any investment decisions. Alright, so in regulated water, there is two words, regulated and water. Pretty sure we all already know what water is, it's what we drink, we need it to live, we're made mostly out of water, our planet is made mostly out of water, I'm not going to go into, I'm not going to go into geology here. But the word that you may not know about is regulated. So, hello Danielle. So, let's go into exactly what regulated means. So, some utilities have the option to be either regulated or deregulated. And that's really where the name comes from. It's either regulated or deregulated. Regulated utilities are ones where the provider, the company involved, owns all parts of the process from extraction or generation, depending on what utility we're talking about, to cleaning and to processing, all the way to delivering it into your house. So one company will be what's called vertically integrated. They will do all the parts from ground to your house. They do it all. And on one hand, this is good because regu regulated utilities allows the company to operate everything. So when they can do that, they are the product tends to be cheaper. They don't need to pay someone else. 
They don't need to then have someone transport the product. They don't need to have someone extract the water. They don't it, it cuts out a lot of different pro, like processes that other companies would usually do. A great example that I always give for vertical integration is McDonald's. What if I told you McDonald's was not a fast food company and that they were a real estate and property management company? I'm not kidding. McDonald's, most of their profits actually come from buying the land and building the building that their store operates. So whenever you see a McDonald's store, there's a very, very, very good chance that the McDonald's corporation owns that land within the like where the building is. They own the building. They own the trucks that transport all of the produce. They own the farms where that produce is grown. They own the company that takes the produce from the ground and gets it into the truck. That's vertical integration. So on one hand, vertical integration is awesome. But regulated is not just vertically integrated. There is one other problem that this can create where there is monopolies, where there's little to no competition that leads to no need to improve services, or more importantly in the 21st century, little need to move towards renewable resources. And that's where a lot of this comes into play. And that's where regulated versus deregulated really starts. So for energy and gas companies specifically, some states allow for deregulated co companies to operate. As of 2020, 20 states, including some of the biggest ones, California and Texas, and then most of the, U the Northeast US, minus Vermont for some silly reason, have deregulated energy markets. So that means that one company can own the generation of power, they could own the dam, the hydro dam, while another company owns the power cables, and another company owns where they store all of the power, and then that same company that owns the cables may own the cables to get it to your house. So that's what about half of the U.S., but about 70% of the population, almost 80% of the U.S. population, lives in a state that has deregulated energy markets. Then other states, such as Texas and Oregon, only have deregulated markets for electricity, while others, such as California, have deregulated markets for both electricity and gas. There is one little other thing here that I'm not mentioning, which is we're talking deregulated from a monopoly standpoint, federal and state level. However, cities still have the option to partner with one specific company. For example, we live in San Diego County. San Diego County, most of the county, has a deal with PG&E where PG&E for the past 25 years has been the only provider of energy and gas for this, for this county. And I'm not going to get into all of that. That's a story for another day when we cover regulated and deregulated um, energy. But it creates its own problems where the company doesn't feel like they need to develop. They don't need to research new or cleaner energy methods because who are they competing against? But again, that's all for electricity and for gas. What about today's topic? What about water? Well, regulated water is a little bit different because for water utilities companies, Regulated is not just a market freedom or a, a commerce term. It's a legal term as well. 
So while energy and gas are extremely important parts of our 21st century society, water is a basic need. It is a human right to have access to clean and safe drinking water. So because of that, we need to make sure that everyone has access to clean and safe drinking water. So to achieve this, water utilities, the water utilities industry, it's not regulated or deregulated state level. It's not meant to prevent monopolies or to increase vertical integration. Regulated means it's regulated for safety. It's we can consume this tap water and have it be safe for us to drink. And it's regulated not by a state, but by the government itself, by the federal government. The big overarching group that monitors it is the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA. The EPA sets most of the rules and regulations for how water can be cleaned, how it can be stored, how it's transported, what amounts of minerals or contaminants is safe, what contaminants at all are safe. So most of the rules and regulations come from the EPA, but also come from this Safe Drinking Water Act, which was a federal act that most, and by most I mean all states follow directly, but can add on to it depending on how they want it. So that applies to over 151,000 water systems across the U.S. This isn't just 151,000 companies to bring water to your front door, but these are every company from where they store the water, how they filter it, where they get the chemicals to filter it, how they transport it, and how it arrives in your faucet. All of that is regulated by the Safe Drinking Water Act. So let's cover regulated a little bit more here. Because let's talk about what is actually regulated here. It's actually a lot. There's a lot of different steps that it takes to get water from the earth into your faucet and have it be safe to drink. So these are some of the different parts and processes that regulated industry or the regulated water industry keeps an eye on. Microorganisms, disinfectants, which are the chemicals they put into the water, disinfection byproducts, which is what happens when the chemical goes in, it does a reaction. It, it does its job. So there's something left over after. So it's getting that out. Inorganic chemicals, things that they can add to the water to make it harder or softer. Different things they can add to change the acidity of it. Then there's other organic chemicals that you may see in water that need to be cleaned out. And then the last one is good old radioactivity. Bet you don't think about that. But water sources can be contaminated by radioactive matter, different radioactive things. So we've got to get those out as well. So some states will have additional measures and regulations for water and water cleaning. The biggest and most prominent of those is good old California. California has an entire other set of laws, and by that I mean over six different laws passed in the past 60 years to help protect and conserve the California water supply. Completely irrelevant here, but let's go back to the days before water regulation. The farming industry used to be and still is one of the largest consumers of water in the state of California. Some smart architect wanted to bring in more water from the Colorado River that separates um, the state of Nevada, Colorado, or sorry, not Colorado, Arizona, and, um, and California. 
but messed up a little bit. They tried, they tried bringing in all of the water, but accidentally flooded part of the desert. And that desert became what's known now as the Salton Sea. It is one of the largest bodies of water in California. And when it first happened, it became a giant tourist attraction. People wanted to go and get their oasis in the desert kind of vacation in the Salton Sea. But there was no regulation. There was no environmental protection. And what ended up happening is almost out of an apocalyptic horror movie. All of the fish died. Everything, the water started to evaporate and turned into essentially toxic waste. It couldn't be drank. It was unsafe to swim in. It killed everything that lived in it. And nowadays, the Salton Sea is uninhabitable. If you live in California, it's the kind of place that's really cool to check out because it's a ghost town. There are still people that live there and it's still a town, but the old hotels, still standing, completely abandoned. All of the docks eroded into the water. All the boats, they're just sitting in the middle of the desert now. Things like that are the reason we have such a regulated industry. Because that wasn't drinking water, that was just irrigation water. But we need to protect the water supplies that we have. As many of you know, droughts, especially in places like California, are very common. So the water, water is not just a necessary resource, but it's a very limited one. So making sure that we are processing it correctly, making sure it's safe to drink, but also that there's enough of it, is all things that go into regulating water and the water industry as a whole. So really quick, I want to cover how water is cleaned so we understand exactly the companies that are involved and all of the steps that it takes. Because I'm not just telling you this so we can have science class with John. I'm telling you this because it's something that impacts us. It's something that we always are touching, literally putting into our bodies, and no one talks about. So while we're on the topic of water as an investment, let's talk about water as a resource as well. So how exactly is water cleaned? Well... It's a, it's a lot, but also very, very easy. We add some chemicals to the water so that we take all of the dirt and all of the stuff that we don't want, and it kind of turns into a giant ball and sinks to the bottom. So once we have all of that junk in the bottom, we have nice, clean drinking water on top. This clean water can then be filtered through different layers of sand, gravel, and lastly, charcoal, activated carbon, to remove a bunch of the little bugs and other stuff in there that we don't really want, but also the chemicals from the first part of this entire process. So, at this point, we have pretty safe to drink water, but it still needs to go to wherever it's going. And to do that safely, we need to add one more thing to it. Chlorine. Now, I know all of the parents that are here are probably saying, wait, no, no, you don't drink chlorine water. That's what they teach you in swimming school. That's what, no, you never drink chlorine water. Chances are the water you're drinking has some chlorine in it. Because most places put water or put chlorine in the water to kill off the rest of the bacteria and the germs, but to also keep the water cleaner as it's transporting through pipes, as it's going through all of the different places it needs to. And then a little bit of fluorine for some nice pearly white teeth health. Yes, chlorine is likely in the water that you drink. No, it's not going to hurt you. The amount of chlorine in it is highly regulated by the good old EPA. 
So the last step here is not needed, but is optional. Other chemicals can be put in the water to change the hardness of it. So basically how, what's the right word? Not rough, but just how hard it is. It's, it's a hard thing to describe until you've felt soft and hard water. Or they can change the pH level, the acidity of the water to make it a little bit more balanced. Again, this step isn't necessary and it doesn't just come down to what tastes better. In some situations, they need to. For example, Flint, Michigan. Many of us know Flint because of the horrid, horrid water issues that they've been having for a very long time. And part of the issue is that the water supply is not the problem. It's the pipes. The pipes have copper and iron in them that's falling off and going into the water supply. So when you're opening up your faucet, you're not just getting water, you're getting parts of the pipe that are just falling off, corroding, and just going along with the flow of the water. So additional chemicals need to be added to that water. Yes, they're still safe to drink, but those chemicals help to protect the water against picking up those bits and pieces from the pipes. So there's no standard for what chemicals they put in here, but these chemicals are important because it is specific to where we are. It targets the need of that community. For Flint, it's adding some chemicals to the water so that we avoid corroding the pipes more, but also limit the amount of corrosion that gets into the water in the first place. But we've talked now for a little bit, a lot of bit, and haven't really gone into the financial side of things. So before we go too far, let me just answer why we're talking about this. Well, really, water utilities are a necessary part of our lives. And as we're going over this industry as an investment choice, it's important that we also think about what an industry does and why it's important to our world. When I'm giving subsector spotlights, I don't want to just tell you Here's the companies, here's the ETFs, thanks, see you next week. I want to give you an idea of why you should care, not just from an investment standpoint, but a human standpoint. That's why when we went through gold, we didn't just cover what gold is, we covered, well, how do you buy gold? How do you also sell gold? It's important to learn more about our world and Subsector spotlights are a great way for me to get to share that information with you all. Not from a perspective of just, here's what you should learn about to invest in it. It's here's what you should learn about because it's everywhere. And there's no better industry to talk about that than with water. But now let's put things back in the context of an investment. Specifically, the water industry as an investment. Utilities are something we need in good markets and bad. So because of that, utilities tend to be a very, very stable sector. Yes, it, it still has its ups and downs. There are periods that the spy outperforms it. This isn't some just turtle that's always just trudging along in a straight line. Everything has its ups and downs, but it is considered to be a very defensive sector that does not have a lot of volatility based on market conditions or if the market's happy or sad. It tends to just do its thing. So yeah, that's the utility sector as a whole. And really quick, I just want to show us all the matrix just to give you again an idea of why we're talking about this sector in the first place so let's head on over to the matrix really quick and we see that utilities is currently 
tied with technology, our previous sector leader, as the top sector. Utilities as a sector also went on a double top breakout today, or yesterday, I believe. So this is a sector that has relative strength and a double top breakout. So it's there's some stuff going on. And then the last thing that we can see is if we look at the momentum, utilities has gained a total of eight over last week which is an incredibly large difference in the matrix. So that was why I chose to do utilities. It's not just a sector that we could talk about. It's a sector that is currently one of the leaders, but also has had a huge rise to success in both relative strength, momentum, and double top breakout status. So that's why we're talking about this today. It is a cool sector from a research standpoint, but it's extremely, extremely interesting from a investment standpoint. So let's now go into that and let's talk about some of the water companies. So the companies are pretty limited. There's not a lot of publicly traded companies in, well, the utilities industry compared to how big the utilities industry really is. Everyone needs a utilities provider and we don't just need one, we need multiple. Telecom, water, garbage, electricity, gas. So it's going to be a lot smaller than some of the other industries we've looked at. But Finviz tracks a total of 16 companies in the regulated water industry. And most of these companies we're not going to be very familiar with. And most of them are national companies. They're not specific to one state. Many of their things will go over multiple state lines. Many of their services will go over multiple state lines. But others, such as, who mentioned it? I saw someone mention this company. Where was it? Elizabeth, CWT, California Water Service Group. There are some that are state-specific. CWT, California Water Service, is one of those like state-specific companies. Now, let's cover some of the ETFs that trade water companies. There's not a lot of them, but they're still there. And some of them don't just trade US. Some of them give us exposure to other, other countries as well. So First Trust Water is FIW, Invesco, S&P Global Water, so companies listed on the S&P that are global water providers, CGW. Invesco Water Resources is PHO. Invesco Global Water, so not just the S&P category, just the entire industry, is PIO. And the last is Ecofin, which is EBLU. So, funny enough, that's it's about all we can really talk about with water. It's something that is pretty straightforward. We already know what water is. The only things we really needed to cover was who delivers it to you, why, and why it's called regulated. To illustrate that point a little bit more, I want to show you all something on Binbiz. So if we go here to groups, and under groups, we go to industry utilities. Here we see something very, very curious. Regulated gas, regulated electric, and then independent power producers. That is that deregulated area. 
Then we have renewables. There's no deregulated water because we don't want that. There is only regulated water. And let's look at how the regulated water industry is doing compared to others. Where here we see, let's look at the one day, one week, and one month. In the one day, we see that it was second behind renewables. One week, it was the top sector with a return of 2%. And in the one month, it has dominated with an 8% return over the last month compared to independent power producers, the deregulated industries at 6.15, and then regular electric and diversified down around 5.5 to 6. So regulated water is right now a really, really strong industry, but that's comparing it just to utilities. How does it look if we compare it to everything? This is where things get really, really cool. Because Finviz allows us to look at all industries, regardless of sector. And in one day, we don't really see it too high. It's right here. Ah! Go away. It's right there. And here's all of the others. So... It's on the higher end of all of our sectors. Here's the one week. Now we're seeing a little bit higher, up at number six for overall sectors. And then in one month, once again, number five. So this has been for the past month or so, not just the top sector for the energy or sorry, for the utilities sector but a strong industry in the market overall. There's been a lot of craziness happening in the market that's been ups and downs. Not so much only ups or only downs, but weeks of a little bit of one, a little bit of another. It's been like a roller coaster, just going up and down over and over and over, leaving us along for the ride. But in an industry like that, the more stable sectors will perform very well. And of them, we see multiple utilities sectors, or multiple utilities industries leading that one month charge. Utilities right here, utilities, utilities, and more utilities. So it's really cool to not just see the sector as a sector, or an industry as an industry, but to be able to compare all of the different industries within utilities, but also this industry within the entire market. If you're ever interested in this, I'm going to post this link right now in the chat for this page, as well as it will be in the description if you're watching this recorded. Take a look through because this view is really fascinating to get to see exactly what sectors are performing very well one day, one week, one month, and beyond. And if you ever see a sector that you're interested in learning more about, please send us an email. Let us know your thoughts on what sector or subsector you would like to see in a future subsector spotlight. But now, I want to head on over and show you guys this. What I've done is I've created two custom matrices. And just to bring everyone up to speed on what a custom matrix is, this is the sectors made simple dashboard. Every day, we tell you who the leading sectors are in long-term positive strength, short-term X count direction, and adding the two together for overall strength. We then can create the momentum table, which lets us compare today's numbers against a previous one. In this case, we're comparing it to the matrix one week ago, which was on August 13th. So that's the matrix, and we look at 11 different market sectors 
and the S&P 500 itself. Custom matrices allow us to take the same method, comparing every company or every sector against another until we get this big matrix that you see here. But we're not just going to do that with the companies that we, Sectors Made Simple, provide you. Custom matrices give you the ability to give it a list of companies or tickers. Anything that is tradable in the U.S. equity market, we have for you to make a custom matrix with. So, for today's webinar, I've created two custom matrices for us to look at. I've created, if we head on over to custom matrices, I've created one using the five industry ETFs that we have. And if we are look to look at that, this is what that looks like. We see that PHO and CGW both have total counts of four. But what's very interesting is they're flipped. CGW has all of its strength in the short term. PHO has most of its strength, but not all of it, in the long term. So does FIW. There's no sector e or there's no industry ETF here that has it all. Has the relative strength for short-term direction and long-term trend. And comparing this matrix against previous ones doesn't really show too much. So it's really interesting to get to see this because it shows that there's some stability within these sector ETFs, but that's not exactly always a good thing. Because if we're relying on seeing a clear-cut winner to pick what sector ETF to buy, there's no real sector winner here. Two have a lot of positive trend, long-term strength. Only one has short-term strength. But even then, we're not seeing much in momentum to say that things are changing. Things, this is how they've been for a little bit. So, if I had to say what I would choose out of this list, I would probably say nothing. It's inconclusive at best. Because there's no clear-cut winner here. But there is one thing I would actually love to try here. Let's go through and let's add XLU to our list. So XLU is our, our, sorry, our S&P 500 utilities ETF. And it will give us an idea of not just the specific industry, but the ability to look at within the industry or outside of the industry, how the utilities group is doing. Then there's one more I want to add, which is RYU, which is going to be our equal weighted utilities ETF. So we're going to rerun the matrix with these five companies, utilities and the equal weighted utilities, to see what that shows us. So it's going to take a little bit for us to run that information. So while that's running, let's head on over and look at the second matrix that I've created for us. This matrix I've created by going to groups, finding our industry that we want, which is regulated water, going to overview so I can see their lovely names, and then sorting by market cap how much the company is worth. So I took the top seven companies, which happens to match up perfectly with all of these companies are worth at least $1 billion. Just a small amount of $1 billion. So the seven companies we end up with are American Waterworks, AWK, Essential Utilities, WTRG, Compañía de Santamento Básico de Estado de Sao Paulo. That's Brazilian, or that's Portuguese from Brazil. But it's tradable in the U.S. equity market, so we still have it. 
American States Water Company, AWR, good old CWT again, California Water Service Group, SJW Group, and the Middlesex Water Company, MSEX. So if we go back to the matrix here, we will see all of those seven tickers here in this matrix. So I will open that up. And here we see, well, a lot, actually. We see quite a bit. Because here we see that there's four companies that all have extremely high total counts. And not just that. These total counts are pretty well spread between positive trend and X count. On the other side, this is like saying it's all or nothing. You have a lot of strength or nah, strength. So on the other end of it, we have SBS, SJW, and WTRG with not a lot of strength at all. And if we compare this to our one week ago matrix, we can see that a lot of these changes, well, for at least WTRG, have happened in the last week. And in the past two weeks, AWK has made some pretty substantial increases in relative strength, going from three, or sorry, from a total count of six Increasing its X count by 3 and positive trend by 1 for a total of 4. So not only is it the leader right now, but in the past two weeks, it has made some pretty substantial gains in momentum. Now, let's go and check on our other matrix, which is now completed. So again, we're going now. Oh, right. If I had to look at this and say what would I do? In my opinion, I would go and look at AWK's chart on stock charts. Yeah, that's too rich for my blood. Really, I would want to see here that we have a triple top breakout and just be above that triple top. The fact that we are um, about 20% above that triple top breakout, the ship... I feel like the ship has sailed, in my opinion. But it's interesting nonetheless to get to see, well, there's where those two weeks of gains came from. A total of seven boxes and straight up. Remember that just because we set a buy range doesn't mean it's going to reverse. There's nothing that forces a stock to reverse once it gets beyond a certain point. Stocks can keep going up indefinitely. But at the same time, the reason we say there's a buy range is not because it's some rule. It's because at a certain point, this chart is no longer really helpful for us. Looking at this is no longer helpful because... There's no other resistance barriers. There's no previous resistance level. The only thing we can have is if we go over to a sharp chart, we can get pivot points. But even pivot points are not going to give us something that is conclusive, like a double top breakout is closer towards. Nothing is ever guaranteed, but something like this is definitely interesting. But in my opinion, as of an investor that relies a lot on breakout patterns and comparing current performance to previous trends, there's, there's no previous trend here to compare to. This is the 52-week high. So, an interesting way to look at it. The other way we could always look at this as well is via fundamentals, but that's a story for another day and one that I've talked about a lot. Let's now go back and let's look at our five ETFs. Then we added the equal weight utilities and the utility sector overall. 
And here is where some things gain a lot of context. All of a sudden, we went from very average numbers spread out, where obviously there seems like something that is better or worse relative strength-wise, to everything is above utilities and the equal weighted industry, which is interesting. Again, let's just talk about what I said there. All five of these sectors have total counts higher than both the S&P 500 ETF for utilities and the Equal Weighted Utilities ETF. Looking further into it, we can see that the only charts that these two are in positive long-term trends for is against each other. Utilities is beating Equal Weight long-term, and Equal Weight is beating Utilities long-term. Everything else they're losing to long term. So that's fascinating. That's really, really cool to see because it shows what happens when we find an industry that is truly outperforming its sector. We have found something here that it doesn't matter which ETF you choose, they're still outperforming long term, that is. They are long term outperforming their two sectors, both equal weighted, which is every company has one vote, think the Senate in the U.S. Congress. And then we have the House of Representatives where the bigger states get more votes, bigger companies count for more. That's our market cap weighted. That's our XLU. So now we gain a little bit more information here, but still there is no clear winner in my eyes. The winner is what you look for. CGW and, F, uh, and PHO, I keep wanting to say pho, my brain's on food, both have eight and seven total count, but in completely different areas. PHO has its positive trend at five, whereas CGW has its X count at 6. Meanwhile, both of their others are at 2. Let's now look at momentum here to see what we can find. That's fascinating, by the way. That is really, really cool to see, because what that's telling us is these used to be much, much lower. XLU used to have an X count of 1. RYU used to have an X count of 0. So they have started gaining some strength. And we can see that they were gaining strength over EBLU, FIW, PHO, and PIO. The only sector they did not really gain strength over is CGW. Looking back two weeks... Now, RYU is also at 3, and our X count for CGW has increased by 1. And then the last one I want to show you all is the one month, because this is the one that we saw where this regulated water subsector really started to shine. And to me, there's one clear winner in that category. Well, really in all of the previous categories. CGW has either performed at or above all of the other sec uh, all of the other ETFs within its category, only beaten out short term by the utilities, both equal weighted and market cap. But if I had to pick here, I would look more into CGW in my opinion, because it has a lot of short-term strength, it is the highest total count, and it still is handily outperforming both 
the equal weighted index, and the utilities index. Or my apologies, not the index. The equal weighted ETF and the market cap ETF. Let's go take a look at CGW's chart. And in there, the real problem emerges. Excuse me. Um, very similar story here to what we talked about before. That's a lot of X's and not a lot of change. In a situation like this, just like what we did with AWK, we may go over and look at the sharp charts, create some pivot points, and figure out where the potential buy marks may be, both our resistance and our support barriers. But based off of these, there's, there's a lot that we can still talk about. But that's a conversation for another day. For today, let's bring things back to where we started. The utility sector tends to be a very defensive sector. And water, of all of the different industries, is one of the most stable in that changes in energy can happen, changes in gas prices can happen, changes in water supply also happen, but is much more long-term, is slightly more predictable, but the demand for water is also very, very well known. Humans need water. Our food needs water. Everything in our society needs water. And it's a very good thing. There's no such thing as deregulated water industries. Because water is something that should be regulated for our own safety, not just from a cost perspective. For our own safety, it's very important that agencies like the EPA and the Clean Drinking Water Act protect us to make sure that we can grab water from our taps and have it be safe for us to drink or feed to our pets or whoever. The clean water industry, or rather the water industry, has outperformed most other subsectors within utilities but also has been in the top 10 sector or subsectors both one day, one week, and one month. And as we see through these relative strength matrices, while there's no clear-cut winner for which ETF is the best, they all look at something slightly different, and their results reflect that. What is certain is that right now, they are outperforming both the the market cap weighted ETF for utilities and the equal weighted. But as we see looking at the one week momentum, the rest of utilities may be catching up. So if I were to do something based off of what we've seen today, I would, I would probably not buy anything. If I were to, if I had to, you're twisting my arm, choose something. All right, I would maybe go look at AWK and CGW's pivot points and see if there's any resistance or support barriers that it's getting close to. But besides that, this is a scan that's now saved. I can go back next week and I can run this exact same scan and I can follow this scan in the future so that I don't just get momentum today. Any custom matrix that you run can always be saved, is always saved, so that you can run it again in the future. For example, if I had a custom matrix from last week, or rather earlier this week, that I wanted to rerun, it's as simple as rerun and click submit. And by the time I finish answering questions in chat, that matrix is already going to be reran for us to take a look at. Lucia saying I can catenate them, check in the candle glance, point and figure, and seems all of them have passed the buy signal. Wow, that's fascinating. Um, did you get a chance to look at the pivot points for it? For pivot points, I tend to look at the Fibonacci just because it gives slightly smaller bands 
that also will, um, it gives you three bands, not just two above and below. Let's actually go and do that really quick for CGW. Uh, no, it's under indicators. I'm silly. Uh, where is it? Pivot points. Did they move it? Where's pivot? Oh, they're there. It was under overlays. So actually, CGW broke above its first resistance barrier today. Let's see what happens if we put in the Fibonacci. So it's been above its first resistance barrier and then today actually broke its second. So that's a very interesting signal. I would be hesitant. I would want to follow this a little bit more before I just jumped in on something like that. But I mean, that is a resistance barrier and that is a resistance barrier breakout. So that is something notable. Uh, the other one that we were looking at was CGW. We also had AWK. So let's go look at AWK. And we're going to go ahead and add our overlay for our pivot points. And here we have another breakout. So right here we see that we have a second breakout. I think the only thing that is concerning to me is the RSI is pretty high. 73 is above the overbought line. Um, again, these are things that I would probably want to follow, in my opinion. I would definitely follow them because they're curious, but I don't have enough experience looking at only pivot points as opposed to point and figure buy and sell signals as well. I've always used point and figure or er, uh, pivot points as in addition to point and figure as opposed to instead of. Once again, here we see another really high RSI of about 74% above our 70% overbought line. So I'd want to probably see that go down a little bit more, but mostly we don't care about the number, we care about the direction. Ascending is better than descending, of course. So I just want to show you the last thing. Ta-da! That last matrix that we ran is done. So again, we can always do that with our industry ETFs as well. We can create custom ticker lists that we can rerun whenever we want. Creating a custom matrix takes about five minutes. Rerunning a custom matrix takes about 30 to 60 seconds. So if that's something that you're curious about, I recommend this is something I do recommend, is going in and playing around with custom matrices. There is no limit to the number of custom matrices you can create. The only rule is you can only run one at once. One at a time, that is. So, if you have a Sectors Made Simple subscription, go explore with custom matrices. If you find anything cool, feel free to share what you find. If you have any subsectors you would like to hear us talk about more in the future, please feel free to send me an email. I would love to hear from you all what subsectors you are interested in. And last but not least, if you have any questions about anything that we're talking about in these webinars, feature requests, or anything, feel free to send us an email at support at sectorsmadesimple.com. We are always looking for more ways to help you invest simpler. So for myself, Kira, my mom, Nate, who's not here, here, but is over there, and Cleo underneath the couch. Thank you all so much for joining us for today's Subsector Spotlight. It is always a pleasure, and we'll see you all very, very soon. Take care. Bye.